Welcome back. Richard, it's good to see you. Yep, it's good to be here. I said, yeah, it's good to be here. Uh, I, I, just, I just have to say, it's the last week of April. Yeah. I mean, they're just flying by. You know, we always say that, but yeah. again, this is, this is like the first, first quarter, right? I mean, right. first, no. Past that. 30%, yeah, four months gone. Yep. And, and yeah, it's just it's just flying by. And um, yeah, before long, it'll be we'll be talking about summer and, and what to do with your kids when when it's summertime. Yeah, it's another one of those years where as soon as I take care of my New Year's resolutions, I'll start to think about my taxes. You know, I mean, it's like everything just flies by so quickly. So absolutely. But, but today, today yeah. we're going to talk about actually a topic that has been um, that seems to be a very popular topic, a very uh, a topic that a lot of people are very interested in, uh, because we're going to talk about antidepressant medications. Yeah. Um, now, of course, we, we always try to prepare or begin these conversations with, you know, with the disclaimer that, you know, neither of us are prescribing physicians, you know, we, right. we don't prescribe medications, we, we both have studied them, and we both have uh, worked with psychiatrists and, and help uh, psychiatrists make some decisions as it relates to medication. Um, so, so we're coming from a, from that perspective, and from the perspective of what the what the research says. Right, that's right. And what happened this week was we had this sort of this trickle of articles started popping up on different websites about um, whether um, antidepressant medications were effective. Did you get any? Did you get any of those this week? Yeah, that couple. yeah, they sort of popped up and they had different headlines. And what happens is um, research is done and it makes its way. You know, somebody finds out about it makes its way into the media, the media writes a story about it. They don't, they don't publish the original article. They, they, um, they uh, do an article about the study, okay? So it just seemed like this issue kept popping up and I thought, what, what is this about? Well, it seems all this discussion about whether or not antidepressant medications are effective or not um, were, seemed to be uh, triggered by a uh, recent study that was published uh, from a, an assistant professor in clinical pharmacy at King Saud University. Now, they use data from the United States. There's a large longitudinal study in the United States. They use those data, but they, uh, this research team um, works at the uh, King Saud University in Saudi Arabia. And in a nutshell, their conclusion was, they concluded that the change in health-related quality of life to be to be comparable or similar between patients who use antidepressant medications and those who don't use them. Well, that, that's a striking um, sentence. And if you, if you just read that, um, your, con it, your conclusion might be, oh, see, I, I didn't think they made much of a difference. You know, we have, we, you, you immediately enter the world of confirmatory bias. You could read that and say, oh, see, quality of your life doesn't change whether you take medication or not. Right. So, so yeah. So, just the interpretation of that sentence is that um, when you compare similarly depressed individuals or pe patients who um, present similarly from a clinical perspective, right. one of them is some of them are on medication and some of them are not on medication. When you compare mm -hmm. their their health related quality of life, right, um, there seems to be no no major difference. And so, um, so medication, the antidepressants in particular don't seem to improve the health-related quality of life for people who, who are on the medications. Yeah, and how many times have we heard our patients come in and say, well, I tried antidepressants, they don't work, okay? And, and you hear that over and over again, and people worry about side effects, and they read, it, they read a sentence like that, and they say, wow, I, I, get, I was right, they don't work. Yeah. Um, and, and it struck me, I said, this is exactly what we went through with COVID. You know, we kept getting um, uh, information about COVID, and people say, yeah, see there, I should be taking this medication or that medication. So we have to be careful what we do with these headlines. And there are two websites, two um, uh, websites in particular that, that give a nice and very brief explanation of the study. One is at the New York Times and one is from US News. And they talk about the study and especially the limitations of the study, you know, that, that be careful when you read this. Um, and so, but they're nice summaries of what the, um, what their, what the uh, researchers were, were uh, telling us. Now, the next issue is why is all this important? What, what is important about this? 
Okay. Right. And, and I think it's certainly important for several reasons. We're going we're to kind of go through three main reasons mm -hmm. why this is important information. Um, and the least of which, uh, I suppose, is the first one, which is that, well, millions of people are taking these medications. A lot of people take these medications. Right? You know, we, we did a podcast. Um, it's been a little while now um, talking about you know, what happens when you come off of antidepressant medications? And yeah, yeah. It's, it seems to be one of the more popular podcasts that we've, we've posted. Mm -hmm. um, and because a lot of people are interested in, okay, so, you know, I was on the antidepressant for all this period of time, and then I came off of it. And why, why do I feel so lousy? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so, you know, we, we had posted a podcast about that. But again, the reason that that podcast is so um, popular is because millions of people take antidepressant medications. And so it's really important that we look at and, and really examine the effectiveness of these medications so that we know um, what to do when our patients are on them or as the patient, you know, what you do when you're on the medication, what to expect. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the second issue is if you just read that, if you read a sentence or two, you might conclude that antidepressants aren't effective. And we're going to talk about, you know, th that's what it's sort of, sounds like it depends what the byline is in the article you know some of the article says some an article might say um antidepressants not effective right and that gets you so that's a byline so you're reading that and um you say oh I, yeah that, that's what i thought too i didn't think they were effective either they didn't work for me and if you just read a sentence like that you're obviously you you may reach the conclusion that they're not effective right and, and so well, we, we talk about that a lot when we when we work with students, right? And they were doing research and we had to encourage them to, you know, when you're reading research, make sure that you read the all the research, you read the entire study, not just some of these um, right. without lines. Um, and but related to that is that is that third, you know, the third reason that we need to talk about it. And that's because, um, you know, a lot of people will use this as a major criticism towards psychiatry in general. Right. Um, we need to discuss, you know, whether or not this criticism is valid. You know, th there are a lot of people who hold some very strong opinions of uh, the field of psychiatry, and um, so it's important that we talk about that. So, but let's start That's with right. reason, let's start with reason one. Um, mm -hmm. Millions of people take these medications, uh, according to the CDC. Right between 2015 and 2018, about 13 percent of people over the age of 18 were on an antidepressant. That's right. you know, millions of people. Right. Yeah, that was close. And now it's it's even more than that. You know, it, it's increased by by many more millions since then. And of course, we don't even have to have a discussion about what COVID did to these numbers. Right. Um, obviously, they, they increased dramatically in 2020. So, um, yeah, we're talking about, you know, uh, 10 to 15 million people are on these medications. That's a sizable number. Right. Absolutely. So and, and you know, when you think about all the people with depression, I mean, there, there are you know, a good percentage of people um, will be diagnosed with depression and or anxiety at some point in their life. Right. And, and, you know, along with that diagnosis often comes uh, a prescription or the, the, at least the suggestion uh, of the, the uh, use of antidepressant medications. Um, now, it's important to know that, um, that antidepressant medications should not necessarily be the first line of treatment. Um, there, there's good research to suggest that, um, you know, the first line of treatment should be psychotherapy, actually, um, mm -hmm. because a lot of, most of the time, uh, depression resolves um, with, you know, some good, some good work for coping strategies and things like that. Um, and, and, but there are some, um, some types of, of depression that really need the medication. Um, but nonetheless, uh, you know, we're talking about a good portion of the population between somewhere between 10 and 20% of people who at some point in their life are going to be diagnosed with anxiety or depression, and um, may potentially be placed on antidepressant medications. Right. And, and these uh, depression and anxiety, which are closely related to each other, they are the most prevalent um, of all of the diagnoses that we make. I mean, right. they're, they're the most likely. So one in four Americans um, struggle with some kind of mental health condition. And of those, the vast majority have uh, either anxiety or depression. Okay. Right. So right. we're talking about very, very large numbers and very important questions because um, 
a, a new, there are so many people impacted by these things and we want to do everything we can. And if you, if you would take medication off the table, um, that's gonna leave some people um, without effective treatment. Mm-hmm. So, so we have to be careful about those decisions. A- absolutely. So, so then we move to reason two. So we, we know there's a lot of people that are on these medications. And so the reason two was that you, if, we, if we aren't careful, you know, some of these studies could lead to faulty conclusions. They could lead right. to, us to, to believing that, okay, med- these medications are not good for anyone. Um, because if you, if you read you know, the results and, and you know, the, the authors say that among people with depression, those right. who use antidepressants have no better quality of life than, than those who don't. Right. Um, but, but that's not the full story. And so we need to look at it a little bit more in depth. Right. Yeah. This is another one of those examples that you have to be careful when you're, when you're reading these um, explanations, when you're reading somebody else's explanation of someone's uh, research study. Now, we're not talking about intentional deception or conspiracy theory. No, we're not discussing that. We're, just, we're, we're only saying that when you read these studies, when you read these headlines, be careful and try to understand exactly what's being reported. Right. Okay. So the first question is, uh, my first question is, what exactly do they mean by health-related quality of life? And that, that was the first thing I did because it's a phrase that you typically don't encounter when the definition is so precise. And they're they're using the definition very precisely in this article. And and, and that's and, and I think that we should encourage people, um, whether no matter what research you're reading, you know, look specifically at what it's what they're measuring. They're not, right. they're not looking at depressive symptoms. They're not right. determining whether or not the antidepressants helped with their depressive symptoms. They're just mm-hmm. looking at health-related quality of life, which means that they probably, and, and they, they use an acronym and it's all in capitals. And so they probably use some type of measurement tool, some kind of questionnaire or something like that to look at that. Um, and there may not be any questions on that questionnaire about depression. <laughs> Um, right. so, so when it comes to, you know, looking at this, mm-hmm. they're, they're not, they're not talking about depressive symptoms. They're right. talking about health related quality of life. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that may not change. I mean, you know, a person could be depressed because they have cancer or because they uh, had a, a serious injury or something. Well, That's their right. depression may be better, but their health related issues haven't changed. Right. That's right. And so, yeah, when, normally when we talk about health outcomes, and that's what we're talking about in this study, normally we talk about morbidity and mortality. In fact, there's a book that was, I, don't, I assume they still publish it, m M&M, Mortality and Morbidity. We talk about health, outcome, health outcomes, we want to know how many people died and how many people got sick because of whatever we're talking about, okay? So quality of life, when we talk about health-related quality of life, we're, we're, we're adding to mortality and morbidity. We're adding questions about a person's physical health, their mental health, and social health. Okay, so physical health is what we see in the ACEs study. Um, is the disorder related to health conditions? So we now know that trauma is related to later physical health impairment. Okay, those are health issues. Do, did, did somebody have cardiovascular disease? Did somebody have stroke? Were you at increased risk for some physical problem because of this issue? Okay. And the other is mental health. Uh, and mental health is just a subjective feeling, a report of some type of how you're feeling. And the third is the health of the community, uh, social health, which is uh, what is it like living in this community? Um, frequently, you'll see articles about best uh, 10 best cities in the United States or 10 best countries in the world. What do they mean by, what are they talking about? Well, they're talking about air quality, uh, transportation, education, uh, the arts. What, what does a location offer? Okay, That's social health. And in this article, they're talking about one aspect of quality of life. Okay? There, there are others. They're just they're just reporting on one aspect, the health related. Um, and here they're talking, they're reporting mainly physical health. In this study, they also reported mental health. As it turns out, if you read it carefully, they also, re- and guess what they said about mental health? Mental health improves when you take these medications. All they're saying is that physical health didn't change. Right, mm-hmm. and, and again, there are, there are many other, uh, well, I guess the first thing is, uh, antidepressants aren't meant to treat 
physical health <laughs> related issues. Okay. Right. So, um, so to, to, it, it is important to look at your, your overall health related, physical health related quality of life, because, you know, um, there are times when, um, because we're depressed, we don't get out and exercise very much. And because we don't get out and exercise very much, we, we start to have physical, um, some physical ailments or something. And so if you're treating the depression, maybe you're getting out and exercising more. And so there's this relationship that way, but that's a, that's a roundabout um, way that doesn't necessarily apply to everyone. Right. And so I, I, again, I think your point is, is really well made that, okay, so your mental health, the, the study suggests that the mental health part improves, it gets better. The physical right. health doesn't change, um, but I don't know that we would expect it to. Yeah, it may not change the, your physical health, okay? Um, that, that's, a, that's, they were surprised by that. The researchers said they were surprised because that's they right. assumed that it would have a positive effect on a person's physical health as well. It didn't, and they were surprised by that, okay? Right. But as you read this study, um, and especially as you read these two articles, and I, I think they're going to be posted, right? The New York Times and U.S. News. Um, they talk about the limitations of this study. And every study has limitations. Uh, every study has caveats. Every study has warnings. That now, you know, we did this research, but let's be clear. Um, and then you have this discussion about what the limitations. And in this study, the biggest limitation is that people, and this is really important, people who take medication are more likely to have more severe depression. Right. So right away, you get a difference in people who have depression who aren't taking medication and people who have depression who are taking medication. And the, very, the important factor there may not be the medication. It may be that the people who take medication have more severe depression and have worse outcomes. Right. A absolutely. And because, as I said, to begin with, you know, generally speaking, medication isn't the first line of treatment. And so mm -hmm. if you have a group of people who have a history of depression and aren't on medication, they may be getting some other type of treatment. They may be getting some other. And as you said, the, this depression maybe hasn't lasted as long. It hasn't been as severe. They haven't right. had as many um, impairing symptoms that, that kind of limit their daily functioning. Um, and so they don't need medication and they're just working through it in other ways. Those right. who are on medications, you know, perhaps they have more severe depressive symptoms. Perhaps they have other uh, comorbid um, coexisting conditions that are influencing all of this, some of which may be more serious health related conditions. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so it doesn't, um, you know, that the two groups are different. Right. That's right. And, and it, and, we, we have to remember that, and you, you made this point earlier, people develop uh, depressive symptoms for, for a number of different reasons. Right. And there are, there are people who seem to have, um, you, you talk about a chemical imbalance, you're talking about people who have a lifelong history of depressive symptoms, that no matter what circumstances they're in, they're just, they just keep um, having these symptoms of depression. Other people have depression in response to some life event, you know, a death, a loss, a, a change in circumstance. And so it does matter um, why you have the symptoms and how severe they are and what, what you're doing uh, to manage them. And so, so what does all this mean? This, this whole, so what does all this mean to patients with, uh, with anybody suffering from either anxiety or depression? It's very similar, okay? And the first question is, let's get, let's get this question out, get it out off the board. Are they effective? Are these medications effective? The short answer is yes, they are effective, okay? Right. They are effective in, re in reducing symptoms, okay? Right. And so all the clinical trials, all the research, and years and years and years of people reporting that yes, antidepressants do improve your mental health. They do reduce symptoms. Right. And, and, and this is this is where the the caveat and we'll talk about psychiatry in general in just a moment. But um, this is where the important caveat of um, is important for many people to hear. And that is, yes, it's effective. Much of that comes from what we call aggregated data. Right. So we're taking thousands of people and we're looking at their their results and we're saying, yes, by and large, 
antidepressant medications are beneficial for people. Mm -hmm. That does not in any way mean that it's going to be beneficial for you. That's right. For an mm -hmm. individual. Um, it, it may, you know, you could take 100 people and it, they may be wonderfully effective for 75 of those people, but 25 people aren't, may not have any effect at all. Yeah. The other part of it is um, there are a lot of different antidepressant medications and the first three that are tried may not be effective for you, but the mm -hmm. fourth one could be, um, That's right. but you mm -hmm. have to stick with it and you have to hold on. So yes, they're effective. Um, it doesn't mean that you're going to see an, a, a positive effect the first time you take it, um, right. but you stick with it and you work through it and, and you find the one that's the right one for you. And, and you know, the likely, it is likely that it's, you're going to find one that's effective for you. That's right. And, and they're, so yes, they're effective, but they're not, that may not work for everybody. Right. And we, we see many people who say, well, I've tried three or four medications and none of them seem to do anything. OK, then that's that's where the work begins. So medications don't work. Um, I remember years ago, we used to tell parents with, with children with ADHD that the medication only works with about 75 percent of kids who have symptoms. OK, so even with with uh, that diagnosis, and I'm sure that's true for all of these mental health diagnoses, the medications don't work for everybody. Okay? Right. That's just something Absolutely. we know. Um, second, and this is a this is a larger question that we're going to talk about in a minute. There's a great deal we don't know about um, about the neurochemistry of depression. You know, we have this notion that it's called the serotonin hypothesis, and that is that people who have depression have lowered levels of serotonin. Right. Well, that's never really been substantiated. That's that's it's an assumption we all accept but nobody has ever been able to demonstrate that a person has, that a person's low serotonin levels are causing their depression. Right, I, I think that if, if there is one, uh, that's the biggest criticism I think that there is of, of psychiatry as a, as a clinical field. And that mm -hmm. is, you know, when it comes to much of the medications, um, you know, a lot of what we believe of and, and use medications are, were found accidental. Right um, in the yeah. 1950s, you know, there, there were patients who were on antihistamines, or, mm -hmm. or um, and it was like, oh, you know, look, their their depressive symptoms improved a, a right. little bit, or their, um, you know, they were on another medication and their their psychotic symptoms improved a little bit. So hey, let's let's make some more of those medications to treat depression. And so mm -hmm. that's when, you know, they started focusing on serotonin, and it, it is it is becoming more refined as our as our. Um, as our technology is improving and we can look more into um, our, our neurotransmitters and, and some of those kinds of things. But again, there's just a lot that we don't know. Uh, we don't know why Prozac works for someone, but Paxil doesn't do anything. Or, um, we, <laughs> or, or people will say, oh, I took Prozac and it changed my entire life. Right. So a relative says, well, I'm, I'll, I'll take Prozac then and does absolutely nothing. Okay. Absolutely. Right, so um, if it was only serotonin, that was the culprit, it would work for everybody. Absolutely. Yeah. And so, and then the other issue is that, um, you know, a, a, another issue related to this is that, um, you know, we, we've run into those situations where medication works for a short time for people and then it stops working. That is right. And that's a huge issue. I mean, people yeah. report that all the time. Is Well, I had some short term, it felt better at first, but then it quit working and they get discouraged and right. symptoms might increase. But you know, uh, there are millions and millions of people who've been taking these medications and they stop working. That's called tolerance. You develop a tolerance for the medication. We right. see this with certain classes of medication where you develop a tolerance and you have to take more or you have to change. But this is another issue that, right. that they work for a while and then they stop working. It's just part of what we have to deal with when we're working with antidepressants. Right. Now, and when we think about antidepressants, the medications themselves, you know, right. there's, there's, almost 30 or so, um, 28 yeah. 29 or so, um, antidepressants on the market. And, and they fall into different categories and they're, they're used in different ways for different people. So, you know, there, there are those, the very common ones that are very commonly prescribed and those are the SSRIs and um, the newer ones called the SNRIs, serotonin and norepinephrine uh, reuptake inhibitors. And um, those seem to be um, the more refined and we'll say cleaner, they have fewer, they yeah, have side effects, exactly. all medications have side effects, but they have fewer, uh, less uh, severe side effects. 
um, but they're commonly prescribed. Prozac and Paxil and some of those fall into that category. Um, some of the older ones are the tricyclic antidepressants and the MAOIs, the monoamine oxidase inhibitors. And um, the, the tricyclics end up having, you, you know, they're a little bit, uh, you know, depending on where you read, they'll say that they're a little bit dirtier. They, they tend to have some, some additional side effects. Yeah. Sometimes they're used for those side effects, um, mm -hmm. but um, we'll give an example of that in just a second. But, um, but the, and then the MAOIs, um, they, are, they are really effective but there's a there's this a huge disclaimer where you, you know you have to be you have to avoid certain foods because right. if you eat yeah. certain foods it's going to uh, result in a in some really serious side effects that, mm -hmm. that it's mostly aged foods so some meats and some cheeses and things like that and you have to avoid those because uh, yeah it could cause a lot of pretty serious right. side effects. Mm -hmm. um, now there is a there is a third sort of atypical group that doesn't really fall into any of the other four, um, but again these medications are like Wellbutrin and um, um, that, that aren't SSRIs, they aren't SN, SNRIs, they, yeah. they kind of work a little bit differently. Um, but you, then you have medications like Trazodone. And Trazodone is an antidepressant, but it's not, it's rarely, from what I've ever seen, it's rarely used for depression. It's mostly exactly. used to help people sleep because- Help you sleep. You know, people with depression tend not to sleep very well. So right. maybe if they sleep better, the idea is if they sleep better, maybe they'll feel better. Right, exactly. So, so that's an example of an antidepressant that's not really, not necessarily used for depression, um, right. but is used because of that side effect of uh, increased sleep. Right. And so what all this means, you know, you have all these medications and you have all these questions. With antidepressants, the challenge is to get the right drug. And when we say the right drug, we mean the most effective drug at an optimal dose. And an optimal dose is you get therapeutic effects with fewer side effects. So that's right. what we're looking for. You're, right. you're gonna get some, you're probably gonna get some side effects. We want those to be minimal while we get maximal, uh, maximum therapeutic effects, okay? Yeah. And the problem, this takes time. You know, we said there, there's the, the, the prescribing physician has almost 30 medications to choose from in different doses. And that's if you're only using one medication. Frequently, people are on more than one medication. And you also have to think about that. So with antidepressants, it, it's not an easy decision to make. It typically isn't an easy decision to make. And it's going to take time and patience to find the right medication at the right dose. Okay, right. So there is that challenge. We know that. Right. Um, so this, that's the second reason why it's important to be patient and take the time that it requires to get the right medication. Absolutely. And so all of this brings us to this, the third reason why we need to have this conversation. And, and that is, you know, what, what does this mean for psychiatry as a field? Yeah. And we've kind of already um, hinted at or suggested at some of the, some of the criticisms I think that are out there about psychiatry. Um, but, you know, let's talk a little bit about um, psychiatry as a field and, and what, where it's going, because I think it is, whereas it, be, it started, again, in a very accidental way, in, in a very, um, in a way that wasn't at all like what you see with cardiology or, you know, any of those others, um, they are working and it is becoming much more scientific, um, especially with new technologies, like I said earlier. So, you know, you, we have like uh, when Prozac hit the, hit the market in, in 1988, um, it, uh, it, I mean, it exploded, right? It, it became a very, uh, it became a very widespread popular medication. It was probably one of the first medication, psychiatric medications that was like heavy on the market and, right. and it was out there for everybody to see. Um, yeah, to see even, though, even, though, yeah. even though psychiatric medications had been around for years, right. um, this was when it really put it into the mainstream. Right. And, you know, the difference, you, you mentioned um, psychiatry as a field of medicine, okay? One, one of the major differences with psychiatry is when you are a psychiatrist or any mental health professional, you're not dealing with a disease that you can um, identify with a lab test or an x-ray or anything like that. You know, if you're, if you're dealing, if you're an orthopedic surgeon, you have x-rays and MRIs and you can look. We don't have that in mental health. Mental health are, are diagnoses mainly made by observation. 
of the person or the person's report of how they feel, okay? Right. So over time, um, especially in the last 200 years, we've seen psychiatry, um, we've seen psychiatrists or mental health professionals develop what at the time seemed like effective treatments mm -hmm. for certain kinds of mental illnesses, you know? Uh, you know, with the, there's a history of the, the prefrontal lobotomy and insulin comas and different treatments that came, what they would come and go. But the game changer for psychiatry happened with Prozac because when Prozac hit the market, and it, it came on the market in uh, 1988, beginning of 1988. Since that time, um, all of us in mental health, or most of us in mental health, have been wedded to the neurochemical hypothesis. That is that um, mental illnesses are caused by some anomaly in the person's brain chemistry, that, that something is wrong with a neurotransmitter. And if we fix that, we have fixed the mental health. And that's called the neuro, neurochemical hypothesis. Right. And, and, and the important thing is with that is, is that we can't see those. <laughs> we can't um, th there's there's two um, there's two pieces to to this whole theory, and that is, are there enough neurotransmitters? So the actual neurotransmitter itself that's released from the neuron, are there enough of those little vesicles that are re released so that they can be absorbed? Um, but the other part of it is the um, the the receptor sites. You know, so are there, is there enough chemical being released and are there enough receptor sites to accept the, right. um, the neurochemicals? Mm -hmm. And yeah. we can't measure any of that. No, we can't we have no tech, there's no technology, right. Mm -hmm. And so, so we look at these theories and we see, okay, so if a person is giving a medic, given a medication that we know, we know it influences dopamine or serotonin or norepinephrine or something, we know that it affects those neurochemicals. Uh, we don't know what it does to that person or, or a person's actual physiology and biochemistry, but we know that it increases, in, say, it increases um, serotonin. And we give that medication to a patient and their depressive symptoms improve. Well, mm -hmm. the theory then is that, okay, well, serotonin must um, be involved and it must be too little serotonin because this medication increases serotonin. And when they get it, they improve their depressive symptoms. So they uh, depression must be a condition characterized by decreased amounts of serotonin in the system and we need right. to take medications to increase it right so when you read you know we go back to the beginning you see when you read these articles you don't see words like researchers have proven researchers have documented but they, they don't use words like that because they know they're not proving anything instead they use words they use words like theories the, the theory is based on this theory or researchers have suggested, or researchers continue to try to understand. Those are the words that you see when you read these articles about medication. But the neurotransmitter hypothesis, this idea that mental illness is caused by uh, an anomaly in, in a neurotransmitter system may be fading. And I think that's the other important issue here is that psychiatry might be entering a new field um, and that the neurotransmitter hypothesis that became popular with Prozac in 1988, that hypothesis may be fading. And um, that's gonna leave, that's, that's gonna create two, two things. One is it's gonna to lead to a criticism, an, again, the recurring criticism of psychiatry, that it's a myth. Uh, we talked, uh, it, we did a, a column recently about the myth of ADHD, you know, that ADHD is a myth. So it's going to, all of those criticisms are going to resurface right. when, um, when you go through this paradigm shift from neurotransmitters to some other explanation. And the critics are going to say, oh yeah, here we go again. Um, the whole thing is a myth, okay? The other thing that will happen is we will see a gradual shift to another and a newer explanation of mental illness. Right. And that's not a bad thing because it's probably going to be a little bit more accurate based on additional information that researchers are providing for us. Right. So first of all, the criticism, it was ironic that as I was reading this, I stumbled on this book. This book isn't even published yet. It's coming out in May. It's called Desperate Remedies, Psychiatry's Turbulent Press 
to cure mental illness, uh, written by a, a researcher uh, at uh, the University of California in San Diego. And he's, his argument in the book is psychiatry has failed. The long and short of it is psychiatry has failed. What we, and the most, the most, um, the best known failure is um, what we did with individuals who had been put in asylums. You know, that we wanted psychiatrists to help these people who had psychotic disorders or complete break with reality. And we have not solved that problem. And right. so we have the failure of the whole asylum movement was a failure. Uh, prefrontal lobotomies were a failure. And, there, and this author talks about this history of failure in psychiatry. Um, and he, this particular author feels the same about what is called psychopharmacology, the idea that you can change brain chemistry and have a symptom reduction. Right. Yeah. So what he says is we have medications that are looking for illnesses. Right. And, and he said, that's the problem. It's not that we have illnesses and we develop medications. He's saying we develop all these medications and now we have, uh, now we need a diagnosis to use the medication. Right. Yeah. And, and, and he talks about how he will presumably talk about how, um, you know, especially like the new DSM uh, takes common um, experiences for people like overeating and temper tantrums and things like that and, and pathologize them and turn them into illnesses and, and mental, uh, mental illnesses. But, you know, and, and as you said, I, I don't think that it's I don't think it's bad that he's that this is being published or that he is a, approaching psychiatry yeah. the way that he is because let's let's not forget that you know maybe 150 years ago or so um people would have physicians would have been appalled at the idea uh, of using penicillin what what has now become penicillin you know or um you know they they would have been uh, they would have thought you were crazy uh, to inject a person with a little bit of, a, of an illness in order to inoculate or to vaccinate them to, to that illness in the future. And, and they would have thought that that was, that was a crazy idea. And now we know that, that those are, are normal, typical daily practices that we have. Mm -hmm. And so to say that, you know, let's not forget that psychiatry is, a, is still in its infancy. It's a, it's a relatively speaking, it's a new field. It is a new field, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, it, and the same thing with psychology and all the mental health field, because, you know, in the past, we thought that mental illness was because of demons or because of possessions or because, you know, we looked at it from a spiritual or religious perspective, because it was, again, nothing that you could see it was going on inside a person's mind and subconscious and things. And so it's, it's still in its infancy, and we're trying to figure things out for it. Right. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, the, the, you talk about DSM, and you know every time DSM is published, and it's been revised. It was uh, the, the most recent edition was in 2013, but it's been revised in 2022, right? This this year it came out again. So they may add, they may adjust um, all these diagnoses, um, but they the one of the criticisms is is that D, the DSM, the manual that we use to identify mental illnesses. Um, the number of mental illnesses keeps growing. You know, I think in the first edition, there were just a handful, uh, less, uh, fewer than 100. And now there's over, uh, over 200, almost 300 diagnoses in DSM. Um, and so uh, that's one of the criticisms is that we're making normal life changes like um, excess eating or grief or temper tantrums. You know, all kids have temper tantrums. All kids don't have bipolar disorder. Okay, and so, so we're pathologizing what used to be considered normal, um, normal conditions, normal life conditions. Right. So, what does this mean for the future? Is psychiatry changing? Well, there was an article published in 2015 that was uh, I, I've never I had not heard of this, I had not seen it before, and I'm just stunned by the magnitude of this study. Two researchers from China studied the references of 85,000. I cannot wrap my head around looking at 80. I thought it was a misprint at first. They looked at the article, the references in 85,000 journal, journal articles published since 1960. And 
they said, based on, based on our reading of these references, our analysis of these references, that the era of the neurotransmitter hypothesis is either already over, it's either already dead or it's dying. Right. Because what they said is fewer and fewer new researchers, and this is, this is one of the ways you can gauge the future of a field. They said fewer and fewer researchers are investigating neurotransmitters and they've moved on to other fields of endeavor, to other explanations, okay? And so they, they went to a recent meeting of the American Psychiatric Association and they discovered that there were many more poster sessions. And what is the significance of a poster session? Well, a poster session is usually done by new researchers right. entering the field and they're presenting new lines of research. That's what a poster does. And there were more poster sessions on the molecular genetics than on neurotransmitters. Okay, and this, this is a signal that the field might be going through a fundamental paradigm shift, okay? Right. So is molecular genetics the future? We, we hear a lot about epigenetics and pharmacogenetics that we're looking at a person's genome to see what medications work best. Um, so is this the future of psychiatry? Well, we're not sure, but it does look like there's some kind of paradigm shift occurring, okay? But in the meantime, um, it, while all that's happening, sort of, we talk about all this is all these programs are running behind the scenes. While all that's happening behind the scenes, it does bring to mind the uh, the analogy of, of the baby in the bathwater. Okay, let's make sure that all these that whatever articles we read that we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater because in the meantime. We do know that antidepressants are effective and they have an important role to play. Absolutely. And, and, and what, what I think a lot of practitioners and, and patients and a lot of people forget is that best practice, and, and this is documented time and time and time and time and time and time again, is that best practice is a combination of medication and non-medication treatment. Right. And so while the medications may, you know, for, again, for the most people, it would reduce symptoms and 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 help the person's um, help the person with their with their the, the issues that led to the diagnosis. Um, the most important thing is is that it can make them available to benefit from therapy. That's and, right. And then the more that you benefit from therapy, the more skills you build, the more coping skills and strategies that you have, so that you can deal with the next bout that comes around the corner. Mm -hmm. um, because the medication doesn't work for everyone. But if it just lowers the symptoms enough to where you can benefit from therapy, then you don't need the medications in the future. And, and you, can, you, can, you have the skills and you have the awareness that you need to, to cope with it in a better, better way. That's right. And they're not a cure. You know, I mean, uh, uh, you don't take medications in, in psychiatry. You don't take medications to cure. You take medications to reduce symptoms so that you can do all the other things that we know are effective. There was an article published last week and it very clearly said, if you have depressive symptoms, if you're experiencing depression, you must move. You have to get out and you have to move. Right. Uh, we know you don't want to, but you have to do it and you will feel better if you're moving. However, there are people who can't get off the sofa. They can't get out of bed. Their depression is so debilitating that they can't even get dressed to go outside, okay? Right. And so in those cases, medication makes it possible for you to do all the other things that we know are also effective. Right. And so, and those are the, the, the non-medication strategies and that is right. to, learning how to manage it and, and building better habits to get out there and do the things that improve your mood, even when you don't necessarily want to, but you just pull yourself up and, and, and you, you know, you, you have to get yourself to do those things. Right. So. Right. That's right. Um, what we're looking for with non-drug interventions is learning how to manage the illness. Uh, you, you may have it, but you have to learn how to manage it. Right. We all have something. And so you have to learn how to manage it. But we're also looking for functional improvements, my ability to drive, my ability to work, my ability to have relationships with family members and friends. Uh, those are functional improvements that medication isn't going to magically change that. Right. Um, it's medication will reduce symptoms so that you can get out and, and uh, build better habits. You're not gonna start walking until you start walking. You, you have to get up 
every day, and it's probably best to do it at the same time every day, but you have to get up and get out every day. And once you've done that for 20 or 30 or 40 days, it will become um, a new habit in your life. It'll be a new way of doing things, but you have to get started. And initially you have to force yourself to do that. Right. Not only do you have to force yourself to do that, you also have to give up something. So you have to give up TV. What, what were you doing before that? Well, I was either watching TV or I was sleeping or I was on the internet. So you have to, you have to give something up in order to build a better habit. Absolutely. So, so our advice uh, to, to practitioners, to patients, to, to whomever is um, first is use what's working. That's right. So, um, if you, if you, if you're taking a medication and um, you, you see these things and you think, oh my gosh, why am I on the same type of present? If it's working, use the medication. Right. Um, if it's not working, talk to your, your physician and, and try something different or, or take a different approach, but right. use what's working um, mm-hmm. to the extent that you're not doing any harm. You know, right. you don't want to do something that's hurting you. Um, right. And practitioners, you don't want to do something that's hurting your patients, of course, but if it's beneficial, use it. That's right. Whatever, you know, whatever's working. I mean, if, if this, but you have to report back to your physician, you have to say that, you know, I've tried this now for a month. It doesn't seem to be working and you work with your physician to get that optimal dose. And and that's going to take time and patience, as we said earlier. So use what works. If the medication works, use it. If it doesn't work, uh, change to something else. Okay. The important thing for us is don't do any, don't do harm. And of course that's, that's uh, issue number one, but also do some good. Right. Okay. If you're a therapist, um, do something beneficial for the patient. Right. Don't, don't just, don't just keep grinding away at the same thing. So we do have an obligation, not only to do no harm, but also to do some good. Absolutely. So, all right. Well, we hope that this kind of uh, helps with some of these decisions that you might be, be trying to make. But um, you know, we'll, we'll keep at it. We'll keep a, a, an eye on the research and see what it says, and 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 share whatever we find uh, to help you all as you might be making decisions or talk, working with your physician to make decisions. So, yeah, if things are changing. If the paradigm is shifting, um, we'll do our best to keep you up to date on these new findings in genetics and molecular genetics. So, absolutely. Uh, stay all right. Well, that's it for today then. Until next time, stay happy, stay healthy, and forget to be afraid.